Hello, welcome along to Off the Court. We had a cracking round nine of Super League action over the weekend. The top two proved they are, in fact, fallible. The bottom three scrapped it out, and we have a contender for goal of the season. By Sergeant Two with the leaping skills of Giselle Allison. To break it all down for us this week, I'm joined by the one and only Tamsin Greenway. Tamsin, we had six games this weekend. I'm counting them in my head furiously. Um, I feel like we learned a lot as well. Yeah, we really did, didn't we? We finally had some shots. Well, I say we finally had some shots. We've been having some shots, but I think in that top four, we started to see what the teams were all about, where they're plan A, plan B, plan C, plan Z, where they're at at the moment. And which is really exciting and also more importantly how the top teams start to match up against each other as well as the bottom teams we're starting to get a bit of a hierarchy happening now as well so yeah it was a really intriguing weekend let's start with where we finished on sunday because we had four games on sunday all of them interesting all of them entertaining but it was a blockbuster to finish with saracens mavericks up against team bath and arguably mavericks listening to you and finally living up to the talent they've got on the court and putting in an outstanding performance against the previously unbeaten team bath side well, look, it was probably the, the game of the weekend, wasn't it? And I don't think anybody expected it. Bath, who were undefeated going into this game, losing to Mavericks only by one goal. But what a cracking match it was. Goal for goal, pretty much throughout. We're going to look at this. And Mavericks, you talk about the changes they made. Well, A, they changed their lineup. You're just going to watch the penalty here. It was 31 penalties to Mavericks, 46 to Bath. And Mavericks really played on this. It helped their game. Imogen Allison out. So Tash Pavelin picking up there. And this was a difference for me. Could Ian Corbin in a goal shooter watch her exit? And just the space she allowed Venter to have in there. And Leila Guskov got caught on Venter's back the whole time. Those penalties certainly helped, but look how Mavericks played here. You're going to watch this release from Kadeen Corbin back to Sasha Corbin on the edge. And again, that back mark from Guskov did just not work on Venter. So are Brown and Guskov not able to work together. This was really interesting from Mavs throughout this whole game because Kadeen Corbin there was holding so high and so Brown not sure whether she was going to exit. She was then able to play into that backspace and it just got the back heads turning. They weren't able to get as much ball as they like, but more importantly, they weren't able to do anything with it. Watch the patience of Mavericks here. They were happy to play this ball around. They weren't making the same on force errors. You watched a couple of passes that could have gone away in this whole passage of play, but it didn't. Like this catch here from Kadeen Corbin, because they controlled that unforced error it was so different and this long ball into Venter again the vision from Cor the Corbin sisters throughout this whole game was insane and I think the tweak in the lineup the change tactically to what happened the more controlled only two unforced errors in that whole game well it took it to Bath and Bath for me got found out in their areas which was this attacking unit and that has been building the last few weeks they've been winning but it's not always been consistently well and so I picked a few clips that highlight this this use of um, uh, border in a minute coming out the circle, they do start to use it, but it's just not as effective. The the work of Joe Tripp and Jodie Gibson, the speed of those guys, and Rachel Shaw just not happy to let ball go over the top. And it just allowed Tripp and Gibson opportunity to come round and intercept the ball. Anna Sembridge talked about them being a bit dodgy on the, on the feed. They didn't want to let it go. You know, watch Bath bring the ball through here again. They like to play the first ball. They just didn't have loads and loads of opportunities. You know, watch this here again. Sophie Drakeford Lewis gone deep. She got outran by Jodie Gibson and wasn't able to get the play she wanted. They don't use Borgia here. And look at Serena Guthrie. Because there's no front cut from Sophie Drakeford Lewis, there is literally nothing on. And this is the last play of the game when they had the opportunity to equalise. So deep in the pocket. Look at this. That was never on to Borgia. They didn't have anything else. It was out of court. And I think what happened was that Joe Tripp, Jody Gibson almost matched up perfectly to Borgia and Sophie Drakeford Lewis, and it just cut out all their options. And worth mentioning as well that that trip Gibson combination was forced on Mavericks early on with Razia Kwashi becoming injured. And, and you saw how Mavericks adapted and it, and it worked because they did have the early sort of advantage momentum. You worry when you lose a player like Kwashi that that's going to go, but they adapted. Is it a case that Team Bath didn't have another option to go to? I think what you're finding with most teams at the moment is they all have a defensive option that works for them. They can bring somebody else on and it's making a difference. Um, I think a lot of the teams now in that top group are trying to work out what their attacking change is, how they can adapt. Do they have to keep the players on there and adapt tactically what they're doing or have they got an impact change? And I think that's what you're going to discover over the next few weeks. And that was certainly Bath's, Bath's choice. They left them out there, but actually they weren't able to change and adapt. So they'll be certainly looking at that throughout the week. 
the big question then for, for Mavericks after that win, it was a huge win. It was great atmosphere amongst the team. You could tell what it meant to them, but they had to back it up. What's it like playing in such huge games in quick succession? How do you manage that high of, of a big win, an important win, with having to go again 24 hours later. The best teams thrive on that kind of buzz and the build and the journey and moving forward. Something Laura Malcolm talked about after Thunder won against Mavericks, you know, that's a journey that was the next step on their journey. For me, Mavericks um, showed that consistency is not fixed in one day, in one game, in one week. It's an ongoing process and it was really highlighted and something that I found quite interesting because uh, we're going to pick them up here. They use the same tactic, Kadeen Corbin in the circle, coming out. But look at the difference with McCormick and Kerry Almond. They dropped into the double really nice and early on Venter, and it just meant they had no other option. You're going to watch the same here. Corbin coming out of the circle. Look at that double on there. And then the shutdown mm. from Carter and Malcolm. That was a big difference for me for what Bath couldn't get on with Tash Pavlin and Guthrie. Um, you're going to watch this here when they brought Rick Clark on. So they did try and change something attacking-wise, but then they had no options in the attack end. As for Thunder, well, they are tactically evolving. So Mvula out the circle, something we hadn't seen in the earlier rounds. Even when they got the shutdown here with Gibson um, and Joe Tripp, look how patient O'Hanlon was to play the ball around. Finally, that release from Cardwell. And then it was just the wait, wait, happy to give the Mvula. That's a team that is changing, growing, evolving as they go in. They've looked at their lineup. They've tactically changed. For Mavericks, for me, they're still like this. I'm just not sure where they're going to gain that consistency from. It was interesting as well, wasn't it? Kat Ratnapala said post-match after the Bath game that they'd, you know, they'd answered some of their critics, but that's something that you've got to do consistent. It's that consistent word. It comes up so much in the Super League. They are listening to, to the noise because we've got every game and everyone's seeing everything. There's a lot more feedback coming to these clubs. So interesting, perhaps, that they're, they're taking note. Yeah, players and coaches are under the biggest scrutiny they've ever been in because not only now when they win games, they're being shown how they're winning games. And actually, a big point about Mavericks and why they probably came under that scrutiny was their inconsistency. So again, seven stars, they won that game, but they had 15 on four errors. They beat top of the table bath with only two, but then they put out 12 the following day to Thunder. The very first two passages of play, Kadeen Corbin dropped a ball and um, Venter got played for replaying. I think it's quite intriguing to see how the teams are handling this kind of back-to-back -back game, mm. the pressure that's coming along with everybody watching and talking. Um, and yeah, the teams for me will be the teams that put that to the side, that rest it and actually keep focusing and building. So you don't mind losing. No team's going to go through the season without losing. That's rare. It's how you build from that. And I think what was strange for Mavericks is, like you say, how did they get themselves so built up for that game against Bath and then drop off a cliff the following day against Thunder? And that is something they have to address if they seriously want to win the league. Let's round up the rest of the um, round nine matches. So the other action from today uh, with Claire Thomas. Seven stars and Celtic Dragons went goal for goal in the opening quarter as 11th place Dragons continued their hunt for the first points of their campaign. Stars have been missing Liana Leota this season and were suddenly without another influential centre quarter as Wales' Beth and Dyke sustained a match-ending injury. We were doing it for Beth, Captain Nia Jones said after the match and her side certainly stepped up in her absence pulling away by the end of the quarter and never relinquishing the lead, with eventual player of the match, Paige Reid, at the heart of the 47-35 to 35 victory. Next to claim a medal for their individual performance was Amy Flanagan, who was on scintillating form for Wasps and saw the two-time league champions up 8-1 within minutes. With Rachel Dunn and Katie Harris shooting at 98%, London Pulse had a mountain to climb. Sam Bird responded by reshuffling her own offensive lineup, with Kira Rothwell moving to wing attack, and the dynamism of Lefebvre Radman and Olivia Tashim showcasing the London side's depth. Wasps were away and clear, though, and even found time for a moment of magic from Giselle Allison. Netballers worldwide were still cooing over her audacious score when the final whistle blew, a confident Wasps seeing out a composed 49 37 win. Another day, another highlights-worthy performance by the Pulse defence, who were as disruptive as their South African shooting end of Radaman and Ziggy Berger were accurate. Michelle Drain was rewarded for a strong showing against Wasps with the wing attack bib and steered the London side to a 24-12 half-time lead. Radaman also merited her start, not missing a shot all night. 
Zara Everett alongside skipper Hanamat Adio and the ever eye-catching Funmi Fadoju held a charging stars at bay over the course of a hard-fought second half. And Pulse would return south with three precious points. Well, an important and much needed win for London Pulse. And Tamsin, it's starting to feel like we're seeing flashes of the team they were last season now. And, and their South African shooting circle of Siggy Berger and Lefebvre Redmond really starting to fire. Yeah, well, you're talking about a team that's evolving. Pulse are certainly one of those, you know. Um, I think they are into about planning in terms of lineups <laughs> and what they're trying to achieve. But look, defensively, they are solid. Um, with Fadeju in there and Everett and Adio and the list goes on. I'm loving what Ellie Ratu's doing and they're finally clicking in the attack end. And that's the journey. You know, it'll be a, a step too far for them to get into break into the top four this season, but they are moving forward. And that is really important with the journey they go on for next season. Yeah, important to remember they still are a really young team as well. Well, look, we've got plenty more to come on off the court, but we're going to take a break. And on our way, we're going to show you some of the skills, the stardust sprinkling of skills we saw across the Super League this weekend, because it got acrobatic. Oh, lovely from Venter, just the behind the back pass. Oh, it's the vision from Caroline O'Hanlon, the Northern Ireland captain, a force of nature. Oh, what a poor Rachel Shaw, nothing else on. Threading that needle straight through the middle of the circle. <laughs> Whoa, <laughs> goes over the back. She manages to pull herself back on the right side of the court. What a handstand. That was impressive. Oh, you oh, just see that oh, lay up in the air from Allison. Lay up going out of court though. Welcome back to Off The Court. I'm delighted to say that myself and Tamsin are joined now by Director of Netball from Loughborough Lightning and Chief Twitter Instigator, <laughs> Sarah <laughs> Bayman. Sarah, thanks Hello. for joining us. Obviously, tough loss to take on Sunday. Have you recovered a little bit? Feeling OK about things now? Yeah, just about. Um, I'm, not, I'm not a sore loser, but I'm also not a good loser. So um, it's taken a little time to, to get over it and kind of regroup and gather rational thoughts around it but um now we're kind of into a new training week and and good to go again the main thing is checking that you're not feeling too much like a flake still because you brilliantly <laughs> combined easter sunday and chocolate metaphors when replying to gary burgess's big discussion as to which is superior a twirl or a flake i think you were spot on with your analysis the twirl is fundamentally a flake that's got its act together and then after that game on Sunday, you did say you were feeling like a flake, a bit crumbly, <laughs> a bit vulnerable, not as structurally sound as a twirl. Yeah, not quite as together as, not quite a twirl day on Sunday for us. Um, like a little bit flaky, a little bit like you open it and it just crumbs everywhere. Um, but yeah, m much better, much better this week, hopefully. And um, yeah, all the chocolate's gone. It's got to be said that, that Sarah at Loughborough have been flying high this season, only loss coming in week one against Team Bath. And it's the kind of loss, really, that you can learn a lot from at this point in the season. Thompson, what did you sort of make of, of, of the game and, and how Thunder found a way through Lightning? Well, look, <laughs> this is one of those games. Thunder uh, came into this weekend and it was two huge games for them, facing Loughborough on uh, the first round and then Mavericks the second day. So, you know, they had a massive point to prove and they probably haven't been firing as well. They've started to tweak their lineup, so pushing Laura Malcolm back into wing defence, which is, I think, where she plays exceptionally well. Um, but it was more about tactically what they've started to evolve. So Karen Gregg and Tracy Neville now have really started to work on that attack end. And to be fair to Loughborough, they were right in it. Um, there were moments where I know Sarah Bain will be gutted with the, probably some of the execution of things, but it wasn't a huge loss. It was just one of those games. This Thunder defence um, that is such a killer and why they're never out of the fight because they're just all arms over. And this all happened in the second quarter in about the last three minutes. You're going to see a flat ball in here for Charlotte McCormick coming in there with the arms again. But, and that was on a centre pass. Nat Panagaro knows exactly what she did there. But the difference for me was Thunder was attacking. Watch Mvula there, the release coming out for Ellie Cardwell. Such a difference for that attacking unit. It wasn't working with both of them tight in the circle, waiting for the midcourt to make it happen. So they've got Mvula on the move a lot more. You're going to see O'Hanlon coming in here. This is the kind of ball they've been thrown away. Watch her go back to the line. And now watch Ellie Cardwell's release out of the middle. And the difference for me, she was sitting deeper and getting her timing right to then open up um, into the circle. 
for Mvula. This is then in uh, the second quarter still as they're bringing this ball through. Mvula right up on the third line and then the positional switch into Ellie Cardwell onto the post. They finally tactically decided something different. However, Loughborough fought back and fought back well in this third quarter. They were five down. Uh, the difference for me is the shutdown. Jazz Odia Berrin uh, coming on at goal defence did a great job here, shutting down that circle. And they relied on getting away with this with the penalty. In another game, that'll be a hell ball and that'll be all turned over. So this really helps um, Loughborough get back into the game. And you're going to see here with Sam May getting the intercept, the difference Ella Clark entering the game also at halftime made for Loughborough. And that's something I'm sure Bayman will be thinking about. You're going to watch her here because her release and ball into Mary Cholock is insane. Why I think it blew out again in the final quarter? Well, that was Thunder's defence. Laura Mouth And I think for Loughborough, it was just a fight too far. I think there was a few little uh, tweaks ball round arms, understanding when players are going to run through on you that Loughborough perhaps weren't prepared for. Sarah, a fair assessment, that? Tamsin can come and take our debrief tonight if you want. <laughs> we'll just record this and we'll play it. We'll play it to the girls. Um, yeah, really fair. I think we, we spoke after the game around individual errors in that game and I think it's probably um, more than we've we've had in previous games, um, like fundamental skills around getting balls around arms and just finding a pass when we needed to. You know, there was times when we, we won turnover ball and we had to work really hard for it at the weekend and then we'd give it away cheaply. Um, and that's a, that's a real momentum killer. So, yeah, definitely a few things to tidy up on um, heading into Sirens this week, which will be really tough again. Yeah, it certainly was last time you played Sirens. I mean, they're sort of everyone's second favourite team now if they're not just a pure Sirens not supporter, ours. aren't they? <laughs> not yours, <laughs> I'm sure, after the way it went last time. And you have got them again this weekend. But if we look, Sarah, you know, we're reaching that halfway point of the season now as we head into a double header weekend this weekend of round 10 and 11. Yeah. You've kind of got one over on most of these teams. So I guess you've got to really prepare and, and plan for, for them knowing how to approach you. Now it's, you know, how do you, how do you develop your game? going into round two how do you give pe give teams a different picture to look at um and also you know what can you do better you know you're not going to completely change your game but if you can continuously improve i think you, you find that the teams that kind of get better through the season are generally the teams that end up where they want to be come come the last round well, just about that, about teams and their journeys and how they adapt across the season. When you are so dominant, so reliant on someone like Mary Cholock, is it harder to bring plan B, plan C, plan D? Or is, and is it easier for a team like Thunder, who have perhaps had to adjust their lineup and change tactically as they go along? Like, what, What's the better position to be in? Um, I mean, that's a <laughs> tough one. <laughs> I, I guess for us, it, you know... Plan, if you go like plan B, plan C, it, it looks very, very different for us. You know, when, when you change personnel, if you take someone like a Mary out of the team, mm. um, the whole the whole thing looks different. And, you know, that's that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's a, a huge change for players. Um, whereas, you know, I still feel, feel like there's a huge amount of improvement to be got from, from what we're doing and, and who we've got in there at the minute we've still got competition for places we've got a goal attack bib that's kind of up in the air goal defense and, and we've got players on the bench you know I think Hannah Williams has come on pretty well in the last two weeks as well so we've still got competition for places and I think if we can we can utilize that to our benefit as well as getting better um, I'm hoping we don't have to make you know wholesale changes and clear benches and things like that during games because I think that's difficult for players to cope with. Where it's been it's feeling like a bit of a two-horse race, really, with, with Team Bath and yourselves, Left for Lightning, and both those teams suffering losses this weekend. The top four battle is, is fully ignited now. We've got five very much in contention, definitely, you know, six in there as well, as Sirens are in the mix. It, it brings us to sort of look at the, the bigger picture of the league, doesn't it? And we, we've had some questions in, actually, to discuss on Off the Court today, which we love from people. And one of them is, should we be looking at extending the playoffs to a sort of top six wild card format. As someone whose team has been in contention and, and been in the semi-finals the last few years, do you think a, a widening up would work? No. Um, in a word. <laughs> no? Shut me down. Okay. Next question. No. Um, Why not? 
<laughs> mainly, mainly because I don't, I don't feel like you should go to playoffs with a losing record. And I think if you went down to six, you kind of go into the bottom half of the league. Um, in in which case, you know, I, I'm not even, I'm not sure you'd you'd get that race for for playoff spots that you do at the minute. I know you'd you'd get advantages of being in the in the top spots, but I feel like you're going too far down the league. What what I would like is is a bit of a longer playoff series. Um, I, I like the SSN version where one plays two and goes straight to a grand final, and then a sec- the second place gets a a second chance against the um, the loser of that game gets a second chance against the winner of third and fourth, and you've got a three week playoff series where you get a bit more reward for finishing top two um, because I think at the minute, especially this year, where you've not got home advantage for finishing top two it's really you know people are just sort of like finish anywhere in the four so I think to distinguish more between top two and third and fourth would would be helpful on that sort of home advantage side of things we've only got you know one more weekend up in Wakefield Uh, we're hearing a lot of positivity from the teams as as to as to how it's been you know the the product as well the way they're staging up the production part with the lights and it does look really smart. And um, Sarah, from a team perspective, how have you how have you found it, and how do you think the league moves forward in looking at balancing this this great product and having more eyes on netball as a result of it all being in one place and being able to show every single game with that need to to have your home venues back? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that discussion is going to come around pretty soon for for clubs in the league, and it's a really tough one because I think pretty much. Every club has has enjoyed that venue at Wakefield because of the staging of it and and how professionally it's been done and the the look and feel of the place and and the fact that it's it's gone out there to to the masses looking that good, um, and how you get that with clubs needing ticket revenue and and wanting home and away fixtures is really tough and I think that'll be discussed at length by the league in terms of how the production looks next year. Um, and also what, what the format is, because do you do you have more games in venues? Do do clubs host a weekend each? That that kind of thing. Um, because I don't think you can take a step backwards in terms of how the sport looks from where we're at now. Um, if you want to keep you know progressing it and getting more eyes on the sport, so yeah, good luck with making that decision, the league. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all for getting it into central venues. I mean, you don't need to necessarily go one, just one venue. You could probably go a north, middle, south. I think that the crowds are clearly really important, but we also have to look at a much wider aspect of how how spectators watch our sport and how they want to consume our sport as well. And so actually, you know, we know that big weekends do really well. We know that big sort of venues like the Copper Box where you've got the experience of Westfield and all the other trips to London and everything else work well for the netball fan at the moment. So I just think we can be far more creative about how we do that. Of course, ticket revenue is an important aspect, but to move the sport forward, as Sarah was talking about, that whole funding thing needs to be looked at with how we support teams individually. But I totally agree with Sarah. Why on earth would we want to take a step backwards at this point now? Like, it's been amazing. Let's look at being really creative about how we keep moving forward and work with clubs and the fans. Absolutely. And the real part, like we say, is that we can see every game. We feel like we know these teams really well. So let's confirm then the round nine results. As we've mentioned, Manchester Thunder getting the win over Loughborough Lightning. Seven stars getting an important win against Celtic Dragons, but losing Beth and Dyke to injury along the way. Wasps beat Pulse and then Mavericks beat Team Bath by that single goal goal in an absolute thriller then Monday night London Pulse took it over seven stars uh, before Mavericks couldn't back it up and Manchester Thunder took the win 59 to 37 which then puts them up to second in the Super League table tied on points with Loughborough uh, but up there by goal difference and Wasps are one up on Saracens Mavericks as well also, because of goal difference, you have a feeling that come those top four spots at the end of the season, as Sarah says, also important, can have a lot to do with, with goals scored and goals conceded as well. London Pulse also moved themselves up into eighth after their win against Stars on Monday night. Um, so this is what we've got coming up for you this weekend. It's a double header to round things up in Wakefield. Two games on Friday night, Strathclyde Sirens against Loughborough Lightning. The rematch, we're very much looking forward to that one. Then Leeds Rhinos against Team Bath. Then on Monday, we've got Wasps against Mavericks and at Rhinos against Thunder. A repeat of the Northern Derby, not two weeks after the first. And don't forget that all six games on Saturday 
and Sunday will be live on Sky Sports Netball. Well, Gary Burgess will be pleased because we haven't discussed rules, Sarah. Although I've got to say, every time I saw a penalty not set at the weekend, I thought of you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I hope the umpires aren't thinking of me every time they do that, but yeah. Um, Gary, I swear Gary. we saw more of them. <laughs> We, we've definitely seen more of them. I, I'm like, I like to think I have some influence over the umpires, and now you know it's just um, it's sending my ego into overdrive, thinking that I can get in the heads. I know. Between <laughs> that and then we had so many attacking contacts as well between you two and your pet peeves. I was like, oh goodness, I might, I might have to umpire myself between Sarah and Townsend when we get on off the court. But look, Sarah, great to have you with us today. Um, good luck for the double header weekend. We're very much looking forward to it. Um, Tamsin, it just keeps on coming, doesn't it? We can't wait. It does indeed. I'm really looking forward to it. And I think this weekend really just um, showed where everybody's at as a, a in each individual team, but also where the competition's at. And this sort of jumping roller coaster ride, which is great when you're an outsider, not so great when you're a coach in it, Sarah. Um, but I mean, it was brilliant to watch where all, where all the teams are and where they're heading at the moment. And my final word for you, Sarah, is just be more 12. You're always my 12. <laughs> Thanks, Tamsin. Thanks, Tamsin. I'm, I'm trying. Do you know to, what? I'm trying to channel my um my inner boost this week, but you know we'll nice. um, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Do you know what? what a way to end to everyone, all netball fans. Be more twirl, channel your inner boost, and we'll see you very soon. <laughs> Bye for now. Sky Sports, feel it all.